Hello guys, welcome back to the Digital Aviator channel and to Flight Sim School. And we're going to talk about a little bit more theory while we are uh, doing our stuff in the air before we get ready for landing and descending and shutting down and everything, completing our flight. But there's a couple of things that I still want to mention and teach you guys about how planes fly. And it all has to do with what we call the four forces of flight. There are four main forces we should understand what they do, how they come to be, what they do with the plane, how we can change them in order to understand really what the plane is doing in the air. And that is of course some pretty valuable knowledge as you're flying a plane. So what I've drawn here is a shape known as an airfoil. This is basically if you cut a wing of an airplane from the front, so this is the front here, to the back. So this is what you get, the shape. And as you can see, it's a very peculiar uh, shape. It is flat on the bottom. It's kind of a teardrop shape on the top. And the shape is known as an airfoil. And uh, if the plane is flying in this direction, the air is of course moving towards the wing in this direction. So this is the front side of the, uh, of the wing called the leading edge. And this is the back side of the wing called the trailing edge. And here you have your things like your ailerons, which can move down and up or your flaps. Those on the trailing edge. Uh, but all of the air is moving over this, um, this um, airfoil. And if we take a look at what the airflow is going to do with this, uh, let's say we have two streams of air. One stream of air is going to kind of approach the bottom side of the leading edge. So it's going to divert downwards and it's going to, whoops, it's going to divert downwards. And it's just going to go straight, follow the shape of the underside of the wing. But then we have another air flow and this kind of hits the wing on the top side of the leading edge and this will go over the top. Now what you maybe think will happen is that this will just go straight like the rest of the airflow because the air is moving in this direction. Under and over the wing the airflow is still moving in a relatively straight line. It's a little bit disturbed by the effects of the airfoil but a little bit above and under the wing the airflow is still straight in the opposite direction as to where the plane is flying. So you might think that the air flow will just go straight here as well. But then we have a big gap here, right? There's no air here because, well, no air flow on the bottom of the wing fills in that gap and no air flow on the top. So, on the top. so this is not what's happening. Um, actually, what will happen is that, well, let's say we do have a gap. There will be a vacuum here or any, in any case, a very low air pressure. And there will be a relatively high air pressure on the top of the wing. Um, so, uh, air always wants to go from a place where there is a lot of air, high pressure, into a place where there's not a lot of air. So what will actually happen is that the airflow will stick very closely to the wing and then once it has left the trailing edge of the wing it will go straight again. So as you can see the airflow follows the shape of this airfoil and this is really important for two reasons. Um, and what I'm going to explain in the, with this example here is how lift of course is generated. Uh, so lift is of course the upward force created by the shape of the wing, by the air flowing over the wing um, and really explaining here how that's created. So we have these, uh, these two different paths that the airflow takes under and over the top of the wing. And let's just think about the distance that the air takes on the bottom of the wing and on the top. So as you can see on the bottom it's a straight line but on the top it's curved. So it has to be a longer distance for the air to go over the top. So what will happen with the air is that let's say we have five atom air molecules here on the top so one two three four five and on the five air molecules on the bottom same amount of air in the same amount of space well these five air molecules on the bottom can just re travel relatively straight so they will basically do this and at the end of the wing they'll still be nice and close together but these air molecules on the top well they can't follow this at the same speed they have to speed up because if they would follow at the same speed as the air is flowing on the bottom they have to travel a longer distance, but if you travel a longer distance at the same speed, you will end later. So by the time these five air molecules on the bottom will have reached the end of the wing, the air molecules here on the top are only over here. And then there will be a gap over here again, where there's no air on the top side of the trailing edge of the wing. So that of course doesn't happen, so the air actually speeds up to fill in that gap that would otherwise exist. So the air will speed up, and by doing so it will stretch out. Because this same amount of air has to fill a large area. It speeds up to fill in a large area. So if you have air that is stretching out, the air molecules come less close together. And you'll have this effect. So at the end they're back again, but over the top here they're spread out. So we have this amount of space here which contains five air molecules, but maybe that same amount of space here only contains two air molecules. So we call this a low air pressure and a high air pressure. 
because there are more air molecules on the bottom of the wing hitting or pushing against the bottom of the wing than there are over the top. There are very few air molecules hitting the top of the wing uh, compared to the bottom. So let's get rid of all of these air molecule dots. So really what we have here is a relative high air pressure on the bottom and a relative low air pressure on the, on the top. Right? There's still air pressure here, but it's lower than on the bottom. So what do things do with, uh, with the high and low pressure? Well, things want to move from a high pressure into a low air pressure. So the higher pressure is constantly pushing against the top of the wing. And the lower pressure is actually also pushing, but less because there's lower air pressure. So the average pushing is upwards because there's more air pushing the wing upwards. That's what pressure does. It pushes against things. And if you have a constant air pressure, you won't really notice it. But uh, if you for in some reason could put your only your hand in a vacuum chamber, your hand will feel really different. And actually it will probably not feel very nice because the uh, pressures applied on your hand right now will no longer be there. And your hand will probably start growing because right now the air pressure is actually keeping your hand nice and small. But uh, there's actually pressure inside of your hand as well that wants to go out. The same is here happening with the, uh, the wing. So there's constantly this air pressure pushing against uh, the bottom of the wing, but there's lower air pressure on the top. So we have more pushing force on the bottom of the wing. So that means we have an upward force. Just because of the air taking a longer path over the top, it has to spread out that lowers the air pressure. This is one of the main principles that generate lift. And if you want to know more about this specific phenomenon, this is called the Bernoulli's principle. It's found in another few places with, uh, which comes to aerodynamics and aviation. Um, but it basically says that when air or when a fluid, air is a fluid, uh, when, when a fluid moves at a higher velocity, the air pressure drops. And that's because it is spread out. And that's what we see here. So this is one of the main reasons that we have lift. We have these, these air pressure differences, higher air pressure on the bottom than on the top. And that creates an upward force. Now there's another big effect here. And this is, uh, has to do with the angle of attack. So what is the angle of attack? Well, if I draw a line here from the frontmost part of the leading edge all the way to the trailing edge you'll get this line here. And this is known as a chord line. Chord line. Hopefully that's readable. So it's a chord line. Now this chord line is important because this determines the angle of attack. Now what is the angle of attack? So the angle of attack is in, uh, the angle between the fictional line, the fictional chord line is not there physically, but you can imagine that it was there. So it's an angle between the, uh, the chord line and the relative airflow. And the relative airflow is just the direction or the angle at which the airflow is approaching the wing. So even if the wing is nice and flat, there's the chord line angle here is still a little bit high, right? The angle between these two lines is zero, but the angle between the chord line and the relative airflow here is, uh, well, it is something, right? It can be five degrees, 10 degrees, whatever. This is called the angle of attack. It's the angle at which the wing is attacking the airflow. So. Right now we are nice flying straight, you know, the underside of the wing is perfectly straight with the, uh, with the, uh, the airflow um, because we have a very low angle of attack. It is still positive, but it's very low. But what now happens if I pitch the plane up? So we start to rotate the wing upwards. And initially when I, gr uh, when I swiftly pull the plane up, we are not immediately climbing. It takes a couple of seconds for the plane to actually start to lift up. So the airflow is not immediately this, right? The plane doesn't immediately go this direction. The plane will still go in this direction initially and the airflow will go the opposite direction, the relative airflow. So we still have that relative airflow like this. And now if we measure the line or the angle between the chord line and the airflow, it is way higher. Let's say it is now 20 degrees or whatever. Um, so we have a higher angle of attack. Now, this is not really, this angle of attack is not a physical thing that we need to be worried about, but if you think about how we change the angle of attack, it changes how the air is going to hit the wing. So now we can see that we have a lot of air hitting the underside of the wing and it has to be deflected downwards a little bit because it can't go th straight through the wing. So the airfoil, the wing is pushing the air downwards a little bit. And if you remember Newton's third law of motion, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. When the wing pushes the air down, the air is pushing in an equal and opposite force upwards against the wing. So the wing is pushed up. So here we have learned that by increasing the angle of attack, we can also increase our lift, our upward force. Now, similarly, we can also decrease our angle of attack. Oops. 
So if I pitch the plane down, I have now decreased my angle of attack. And the initial airflow, maybe still this, is this. After a while, of course, because the lift pushes the wing down, we start to move down. So then the relative airflow is also like this. But initially, the airflow is still horizontal here. And now you can see that we have a lot more air hitting the top side of the wing, which has to be deflected upwards a little bit. So the air is uh, pushed upward by the wing, which means the air is pushing the wing down. So now we have negative lift, right? We have a downward force. So these two... Um, reasons is how we generate lift. It is Bernoulli's principle, which gives us a high pressure on the bottom and the low pressure on the top. And the wing is pushed into that low pressure by the high pressure on the bottom. So that's an upward force. And the faster airflow we have, the higher this difference in air pressure is. So the, the higher the, uh, the upward force called lift. And if I increase the angle of attack, we also increase our lift because the air is deflected downward, which means the wing is deflected upwards. But if I lower the angle of attack by pitching down, we have the opposite effect. The wing is then pushed down by the wind, by the airflow. So we have negative lift. So this is how lift is generated. This is kind of the magical thing that makes planes fly. So hopefully that is, uh, makes it a little bit more understandable. Now in the next video, I'm going to talk about how lift fits in with the other three forces. Remember, I wanted to talk about the four forces of flight. Lift is one of them. And it required a little bit of explanation to, uh, to see how it is generated, which is what this video was for. But in the next video, I'm going to um, put it together with the other three forces and we're going to see how the plane is really going to move through the air and how it's going to change its movement through the air if I change one of these forces and we have a lot of control over these forces. So stay tuned for that for the next video and uh, thank you for watching.